We are live. This is yeah. Value After Hours. We've got the whole crew together. Billy's back. I'm Tobias Carlisle, Jake Taylor, and Bill Brewster. What's hey. happening, Billy? What's news? I don't know. You tell me. I'm uh, I'm just scrolling a bunch of things. I <laughs> now you're now you're gonna have to pay some unauthorized royalty. unauthorized music. <laughs> <laughs> nah, man, things are good. How's everything here? Life is good. It's What's going sad. on with the value spread? Yeah, it closed up, but it's it's not. I don't think it's been helping out value much. <laughs> well, that's not ideal. Yeah, what's going that's on? That's not here? how we thought it would happen. I was promised a triumphant return to glory. Yeah, that's what I was. Well, nobody ever said when. <laughs> what's going on? I don't know. I think it's been a, it's been a rough. It's 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 not been a great run, honestly, for value. I think I saw today that the growth is outperforming value by twenty three percent for the year or something like whatever that means. But it was for hmm. the. So you're telling me there's a chance. Getting smashed again seems a little bit unfair. <laughs> yes. I mean, it seems like every day Microsoft just goes up. Is it kind of interesting? Is it back to all time highs? Did it get it went, above? Yeah, it went through all time highs about a week ago, I think. Wow. Congrats, everybody. Congrats to the longs. Yeah. That's right. It's Lots been of a while other since they've won. Haven't, right? I mean, Amazon, I think, is still below. Google's below. Yeah. Meta's close. It's not there. I think they've all done pretty well. Meta's had a banging year. Amazon, yeah. I don't know. Hang on. That's like a hundred percent for the year, I think. Actually, yeah, still... Amazon's still got a way to, ways to go. Arc is something like 50% plus for the year, and it's down from, from, from its peak. How far down? Oh, not much. I mean, I mean it's a bit. Like I, 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 didn't, I kind of just eyeballed the chart, but it's at like 46 bucks. I guess it started around 30, but it's been higher. Hmm. See, Arc Innovation. We're so bad. Man, it was high. <laughs> Whoa. That was, that was like uh, dazed and confused high. Uh, the, the irony that you had to pause for a while to. What? <laughs> let, me, uh, let me do a shout out. Yeah. We get, we get the... Geography lesson time. I think. Oh, that... I think uh, Arc top ticked at 156. My lord. It is amazing. Mm. Kennesaw, Georgia. What's up? Nashville, Tennessee. Antigonish, Canada. Cupertino, Winter Park, Florida. Miami, Norberg, Sweden. Toronto, Lund, Sweden. Sweden in the house. Ottawa, yes. Brandon, Mississippi. Dino's in Townsville. Good man. What time is it there? Like six thirty. Speaking of the Nordics, did you guys catch? We talking uh, AM? The Norwegian uh, manager that runs like their the sovereign wealth fund for Norway. Have you guys heard of this guy? No, I have not. Uh, he did an interview with Mal Boson recently, and um, Ian Castle wrote a post about it. And uh, it's interesting. It's probably worth listening to. But they have something like. One and a half percent of all the global equities on planet Earth. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Smart. That's big. Smart. We should do that, that as a government. Uh, so own shit. Chicago, Tallahassee, New Brunswick, Canada. Dubai, Leeds, Savon, Lina, Finland in the house. Dallas, San Diego, Salem. What's up, Salem? Grief sword, London town. Enjoying a pint, good man. <laughs> Edinburgh. Old Ocean, Texas. Cool. Good show. All right. A Did truly I... global listening base or a bunch of people VPNing in and saying that they're from somewhere that they're not. All yeah. right. Well, Southern Hemisphere representing Dino. Dino's, keeping, Dino's on watch for the entirety of the Southern Hemisphere. The yeah, homie in uh, Townsville, it's 4.33 a.m. Yeah. 4.30, wow. sorry. Dan. Wow, what an effort. Yeah. Legend. Or you're early, just man. like a total degenerate. I don't know which one, but <laughs> either way, thanks for before. tuning in. Either way, we love you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Every Monday, I get hammered and I stay up for my guys of value after hours. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be Wednesday. It'll be Wednesday morning. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, my bad. I can't <laughs> even do that. <laughs> 
he's not a de- he's not that much of a degenerate. It's not a Monday night drink. It's a Tuesday night drink. It's a good point. Sunday night drink. That's yeah, fine. yeah. That's right. He's he put in a good day of work. The weekend this week. starts on Tuesday night. You're not wrong. What's new in the world of Billy Brewster? Oh, just fun stuff. I don't know. I I find this. I, I'm interested in this restoring the castle report that Elliot or pitch deck that Elliot put out yesterday or two days ago. Uh, they are going that? after crown castle ah. arguing that the CEO is misallocating capital to fiber and small cells. And um, I think it's a well done pitch book, which you would expect out of Elliot management. But um, yeah, those guys seem to know what they're doing. They do indeed. I I am curious whether or not this particular team has expertise in the domain. I mean, I know that the firm, the firm they're going to say has dom- you know expertise, but I wonder about the the actual people running this process because the argument makes a whole lot of sense to me. Um, and, and if I kind if of I turn around, where if you're stopping capital misallocation, it's not like you got to fix the core business. You just got to stop some idiot from doing something. Or fire the idiot. And if I remember right, Crown Castle does like small cell uh, towers. Well, yeah, macro cells, and then they've diverted a bunch to fiber and small cells, which I think Elliot has a fairly compelling case at this stage that, let's put it this way, the stock has underperformed peers. Elliot has cited their presentation in 2020, where I think they advocated for some reasonable changes in management compensation it was not done or their their suggestions were not implemented since then crown castle i think has appointed a few people to the board that don't have t- uh tower experience so it's like one of those things that if they can kind of shake things up and people are upset enough i i did find if you pull it up it's called restoringthecastle.com uh, slide 35, I thought I found this slide to be somewhat insulting. It so the the st- the slide is titled Stock Performance Since Jay Brown Became CEO. And it says days where buying CCI versus SBAC was a good idea. 1877 days, bad idea. Good idea, seven days. And then where it was a better buy than American Tower. 1,881 days, bad idea, three days, good idea. So they're really going at this guy. And they're using, just saying that like outperformance on an no, individual no. day or what? What's the no, three? Well, well, how do you get three individual, days? Not individual. They're saying out of 1,884 days, the stock is underperformed on 1,881 of them. And it's unlikely that that is a good sign. And then, I mean, they go through the economics, but their, their, their basic argument is the fiber build out is, is generates returns less than, than awesome. desirable to say the, the nicest possible way. And what would they do? I, instead? I, What's their proposal? What's the counter proposal? Well, I think that you, they would say that you probably need to potentially expand internationally or just like really max out the macro site, the, the cell towers in the U S and rather than, you know, diverting cash flow for just growth, just dividend it out. I mean, I think their point is just stop doing anything other than towers because towers are a really good business. And all you're doing is ruining the, the economic value of the franchise, mm. which is, I kind of like those. Cause it's, I'd rather start off with a really, good core piece of a franchise than try to turn around something broken. Yeah. Addition through subtraction. Yeah. So I don't know what you watch for. I don't know if you watch the proxy to see if they sort of start compensating on return on invested capital, or I don't know if you watch to see if some of the board members get kicked out. I don't know what the sign is that you look for to see, is this campaign, does it have, you know, some runway behind it? Cause if it does, I'm intrigued. All right. That's Elliot. Yeah. I mean, they're not bad at what they do. Rumor has it. But will they bring in a battleship and uh, (laughs) seize anything? 
They should. I was at a wedding where someone was representing that their fund, a British bloke was representing that his fund had done what Elliot had done. And I was like, oh, mate, it's just not your lucky day. I work in this business. <laughs> I know who it was and it wasn't you. Really? Could have told this story at any other wedding. You'd probably been okay. Yeah. You call him out on it or do yeah. you just walk away? Yeah. yeah. I just said, ah, Elliot did the same thing. Yeah. That's a shocking story. It reminds me of when Paul Singer did it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or Amazing. his firm did it. What are the odds? Yeah, boy. That's wild that the second time it happened wasn't covered. Yeah, and we didn't hear alas. about the second time. And yours yeah, was you're... in South America too? My God. What were the chances? Yeah, it's crazy. You must not be very good at PR, bro. How big did you say your fund is? Oh. Anyway, not that size matters. It's how you use it. In that instance, though, I do think you'd benefit a little bit for some size. You'd when hope. You're, when you're getting your own army. Yes, yeah, that's right. <laughs> It'd be tough to do with a PA. Yeah. Unless you had a real nice PA, which is possible. Mm. So anyway, that's the thing that's uh, crossed my desk recently that I found most intriguing. Any macro thoughts this to this share? Year? Yeah. yeah, what's happening in this market this year? I have no macro thoughts. I'm trying to figure out if cable is... Uh, is what I thought it was, or if it's not, I I have sold to get rational. I think it's an example of uh, one that I talked about so much that I'm not sure that I was able to look at it um, mm. in the right way. So I I'm still not sure how I feel, and I'm I'm not sure uh, even if I I'm not sure that it's the best risk reward. I know I don't like wireless. That I'm certain of. I just don't know if that means that I like cable. So I've spent some time on that. Um, I don't know, man. I, I, you know, I'm a little pissed that I, you know, feel like I missed when uh, rates ticked five, but you're not going to top tick everything. What, what would you do there? You wanted to short them at five? You want to lock no, in no. I just, I, I wouldn't mind like locking in some yield. I'm, I'm a boomer. I, I enjoy income, which I know is like a crazy thought, but. Especially <laughs> when it doesn't have credit risk associated with it. Um, but we'll see. Maybe maybe they'll go higher. It's fallen off pretty quickly. The last time I saw it was like 4.37 or something like that. Or the 10-year? I thought so. Yeah. Hmm. Is that right? Could be. I'm just making stuff up. Yeah. No, it could be. It, it did. It sold off hard. Yeah, 4.36. That's a big difference from 5. That sucks. Quickly, too. Yeah. What is the? Why is that? I don't know. What's happening? I don't know anything about rates. I don't know how any of that works. Yeah. They go up and they go down. That's Seems like I mean. they mostly go down. <laughs> I, I talk about the yield curve, but like I couldn't tell you why any any part of it does any part of it. It has been interesting, actually, that the, you know, it, it looked like it was going to close pretty quickly, that inversion. And it was racing. And then like mid September or beginning of October, something like that. Because, you know, it was all that talk about the steepener, the bear steepener, where the 10-year races up and the, the curve normalizes by the back coming up in mm. line with the front rather than the front coming down, which is a bull steepener or something. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know what any of that means, but it, I, was, I was pointing out that it was closing and people were saying, no, it's closing in the wrong way. It's the, it's the bull steepener, not the bear, whatever. Mm. But then that... It, since that 10 year has come back from five to 4.37, the inversion it's reinverted pretty significantly. I don't know what any of that means. Just observing. So what does that move us all the way back to like, I don't know, four months ago or something. Yeah. It's, it's only, it's back a few months. Okay. It's back a couple of months, something like that. And we probably saw these numbers late last year as well. So that's like the, the size of the dip. But it's the longest one we've ever seen. I don't know what any of that means. Longest one we've ever seen. Not the deepest one if you go back and look at night the late nineteen seventies looks the same. Late nineteen seventies was weird. It 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 gets very steep and then it flicks back normal and then it gets very steep again. I don't know if that was the the Fed trying to tamp down on inflation by jacking up rates and then you know everything got a heart attack when it did that, so it slowed back down again. I don't know, dude. 
It makes me a little bit nervous seeing it like that. Risk on, baby, I guess. Seems to be. But I don't know. There's a lot of liquidity around. There's a lot of stimulus. There's a lot of, you know, that Inflation Reduction Act is very stimulative. Yeah, it is. Is it reducing inflation yet? <laughs> that horse is bolted. It's a long-term investment in that. The uh, the weekend flights, that was the most flights we've had on TSA. Most people through the TSA checkpoints, everything ran pretty smoothly according to the TSA. Hmm. Ah, yeah, you got the JetBlue Spirit merger. That's kind of interesting. Kind of kind of come around to thinking that that should get done. Hmm. Um, How do you guys feel about uh, Big Sandwich suppressing us? Keeping us um, all down as the consumers. <laughs> See the Why thing. Does she focus on things like that? Uh, it's so strange. It's so strange. Of all of the things you could focus on, like the NAR charges six percent on every sale of a house, or recommends that they're yeah, there. and ignore that, and then talk about some sandwich joint buying another sandwich joint. It's not like there's a restricted supply in sandwiches. Yeah, we're all getting Jimmy John. Yeah, the fucking realtor <laughs> cartel needs to be broken up. I was complaining about this to somebody. It was actually my mother who's a realtor, which potentially <laughs> yeah, that's that why go. she's a little bit mad at me. I don't know. <laughs> but I was like, it's 6% of gross, right? What, what What's the average loan to value on a house? Like 60%, right? So what's 6% of 40? Like you're fucking taking 25%. Almost. I know my math's off, but I'm mad, so I'm going to exaggerate for, <laughs> for a fact. Yeah. And it's like you're doing this in a job that anyone could do. I mean, now not anyone can do it well, but so so why are people so freaked out that these realtors all of a sudden have to actually like negotiate whether or not they're worth the 3% fee? It seems like a big clip. Newsflash, most of you aren't. Sorry if you're listening. I'm just telling you, you're not. But- you know, some are, and those people deserve to get paid a lot. But you could also get paid on like, you know, we do a 360 view of the inside of the house. We charge this and there's a markup on that. Like you just charge per, I think they do that anyway. But Well, this is, know. this is what I actually said to my mom. I said, I think you're actually a good realtor. I think you're good. You're somebody that's not going to put somebody into a house that can't be remodeled. Right. Because one of the worst things is you buy a bad, like fundamentally a bad layout and you think you can knock down walls or a realtor says, oh, you just bump that wall out. It's not going to cost anything. You f figure out, oh my God, I can't actually just do that. So I said, like, I think you deserve the fee, but I don't see why 3% is just this default that everyone has to pay. Like, this is yeah. absurd. It's 2X global number. Just think of the amount yeah, of equity right. you're just extracting in fees. And then, oh, well, it's the seller that has to pay it. Okay. I'm sure it's not baked into the price. What a stupid comment that is. Yeah. <sighs> anyway. So Consumer hopefully that, hopefully pretty, those fees do come in. Consumer seems to be in pretty good shape. Consumer's spending a lot. Yeah. Well, just think know. how much better they'll be when their sandwiches are are cheaper. <laughs> I don't even know. It's been so long since I've had a big sandwich, the foot long. I don't even know if they charge for them anymore. I thought you meant a sandwich from Big Sandwich, but actually truly a Big Sandwich. Art of Value says love a Big Sandwich. Yeah, that's what I thought too. Every time I see Big Sandwich, I think, yeah, I should get a Big Sandwich. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> Let's do that. The, um, shoot, what was it? United Wholesale Mortgage. That was pitched to me a while ago, and I didn't buy that. And that was a good pitch. That's do, we need to, do we need to add context to our comments that, this is about Elizabeth Warren's uh, posting or whatever. Warren. Do they? I don't know. Maybe people outside the U.S. might not know. She's basically doesn't want Subway and some other sandwich chain senator. To, yeah, to, to merge because apparently there's not not enough competition between restaurants, even though it's probably the most competitive industry on planet Earth. If you define it narrowly enough as footlong sandwiches, footlong Subway sandwiches, then there's only like, like how many competitors are there? There's only like there? six. There's like <laughs> 10, I don't know. Jimmy John's, Mike's, they're all that kind of style of sandwich. Yeah, Subway, Firehouse Subs, that might be more local in my area, I'm not sure. Any any hoagie from anywhere? Uh, Togo's. 
but if you define the sandwiches a little bit more broadly than just that <laughs> stuff, that, that's a pretty big. That's a pretty big market. Is a talk know. is a taco a sandwich? I don't know if we ever figured yeah, that no, out yeah, either. It's now question. it's really is a hot dog a sandwich. Yeah, <laughs> asking the real big philosophical questions now. Getting into the deep stuff. I mean, this might upset some people. I don't mind. <laughs> I don't mind the government being a little bit more. I, I I don't mind U.S. taxpayer resources going to try cases where there's a legitimate interest that deserves to be heard, but is a loser. Mm. I do obviously think that the sub case is a silly use of any type of brain power, but like the spirit jet blue merger, I'm, I'm all for the government bringing that kind of, I may be a losing case. It may look dumb now. I get it. I, I fundamentally thought that it made sense to bring it. I still think it makes sense to bring it. I don't, I'm not, really all that uh, i think we made enough master? mistakes not after ticket master oh. well yeah i mean there but what just you... seems to me like there are more obvious ones that people are more upset about i've literally never heard anybody complain about <laughs> subway sandwiches <laughs> oh there's just there's only subways yeah what well that senior one's, starbuckers? that's crazy senior starbuckers has got a bigger footprint than subway maybe that's not true i don't know i don't know how many stores they got it feels like it's true yeah, I mean, the sub thing is stupid. It's really dumb. I mean, I haven't had a subway since the late 1990s or something like that. Yeah, well, and also, like, if you're from Florida, you know that public subs are the only subs. Ooh. Hot or anywhere there's in the a, southeast. Wawa. Wawa's hot. If Wawa had subs, immediate entrant to the sub game. What they probably Big do taco? have subs. Get off to Big Taco. Yeah. No, that's that's silliness. But, you know, like, I don't know. Some of the other ones I kind of get. Yeah, I think that's the the real issue is that we're like we're distracting from actual legitimate cases by this stupid you, grandstanding. You, that's she's just an idiot that put out a tweet. I don't think that we should, you know, give it that much attention here. But it's uh, hopefully somebody <laughs> above is like, all right, we're not going after the sandwiches. <laughs> You'd hope that at some level of decision making, they're like cooler okay, heads prevail. It's yes. got to be bigger fish to fry, like just uh, <laughs> big fish. That's <laughs> big fish. Yeah. Tell you something. Here's a thought. Uh, not a great business. You're welcome, but we're on a value podcast, so no one cares about business quality. Oh, I, ouch, kid, ouch. I kid. I kid. I <laughs> kid. Uh, Sir, those are joined at the hip. I did correct. <laughs> um, Allegiant. Allegiant could be a beneficiary of this JetBlue and Spirit merger should it get passed. And they're about to have a their, what is it, the Sunseeker Hotel come on? That's kind of interesting. And that model is not the worst model in airlines. Could always just play Delta, I guess. But they're going to be more in, attacked on the margin. I don't know. These are just the thoughts that go through my head. What's the Sunseeker thing? I've never heard of that. They were, they're developing a, I'm pretty sure it's in Orlando. It's definitely in Florida. It's like, uh, basically they're becoming a cruise company without the cruising. They just, you f they fly to the hotel and then it's like an all, in all inclusive hotel all through so, Allegiant uh, low cost. But you know, that lo low cost model is a pretty good model. It's, it's work throughout the world. So we'll see. You see, there's a Forbes 30 under 30. Are we on there? New one out, which, uh, no, I've forgotten again. Passed over we again. We unfortunately are too old. The Fake, uh, fake uh, news. I, I identify as a 29-year-old, 26-year-old. <laughs> well, who are we to say otherwise? My, uh, my, I think that the, the DOJ and the FBI love it when they come out with those 30 under 30s. It's like Minority Report. It's like a little glimpse five years into the future. Is that right? Who's going to who's gonna yeah. be on the, behind with the hands behind their back? That's it. The strike rate from some of those has been pretty impressive. Like mm. the one that had SBF, they've caught it. Like wow. SBF and yeah. This is like the financial version of the Madden curse, basically, huh? Yeah. Magazine yeah, curse. except you go to jail. You don't have a bad season. <laughs> Fair enough. I see that uh, Michael Lewis is still out there. He said that the... Uh, this is pretty inflammatory, but he said he he went. He said that the uh, the trial of SPF was like a lynching. Uh 
I don't think it was like a lynching. So I think I watched that interview. It was he was he was talking with um who's the other biographer of our times. Uh, Are you going to say this is fake Bible? news? Huh? Are you going to say this is fake news that it wasn't actually a lynching comment? Uh, no, but I, I mean, it's always when you hear all these things in context, they're never going to put context around this. Yeah. It's a podcast, Jake. This immediate <laughs> context. Uh, yes. Jeez. Right. You're defending like Michael six... Lewis. You're a racist. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I'm sure. I'm sure he didn't say it the way that it may have sounded. What? What? How did I he think say he it? said you just have to be? I think he said you had to be careful about Bob rule like that. Like you can, it's scary when you're on the other well, side of it. Wasn't he convicted in a in a court of law with twelve of his peers? Isn't that how it works? That was a very quick conviction. Yeah. Um. Probably. Seems seems right. Seems like he was basically just stealing money out of there, right? Yeah, I don't think that was. A, I mean, it was it was complicated by the fact that there was some technology there, but ultimately the. Now one of the fraud. one of the interesting things from that interview that he did was uh apparently there was like no org chart at all for for that company if it, mm. if you even call it a company and like they didn't even know who to go after cuz they didn't know who even worked there. <laughs> it was like smart <laughs> smart. That yeah. is smart. Don't put it on paper. Yeah. Could get him with a Rico or something like that. It's not written down anywhere. So who knows like do you even work here? Uh no. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I never worked here. WhatsApp and Signal encrypted. They deleted. Took down, they took down CZ from Binance too. That was like a wait, four point something billion dollar fine. CZ has to turn himself into, which he's already done. And he's been charged with a whole lot of criminal charges. Does he have the money to pay that? He was able to pay the four. Yeah, he came up with the four. He's come up with a whatever, $150, $150 million bail too, I think. Something like that. It's a big number. They say that he's made 20 or something out of it, so the four. But then, you know, I don't know, the fraud charges, the, whatever the charges are, they're pretty serious. Hmm. Do you think that any of those other guys get, like, coin as public? They are know. public, aren't they? Yeah. I, did, I always got the any... sense, though, when I looked at that, um, I did a, a fairly deep dive on it a couple years ago now, but I think they always tried to really push hard to stay on the right side of regulatory, um, including like moving a lot slower than the other ones because of that. And, and even trying to like, it seemed like a little regulatory arbitrage at play to me there, but um, I don't know. I think part of the problem for, uh, for SPF was that Alameda was doing a lot of the trading on the, on the site it was creating a lot of the, liquidity or creating and uh, creating a lot of the marks too that had some when all the trading got turned off they had some algorithm that was going through and bidding more than it was just bidding stuff up all the time and you couldn't see it until the trading got turned off and then when it got turned off you could see this step change in the prices that shouldn't have been happening just washing everything you know every once in a while i want to think that the market isn't crazy and then i see that coinbase has a 30.4 billion dollar valuation oh if it's not and it makes crazy, one wonder why what if it's not crazy then we're all out of a we're all out of a job we're all out of a gig i mean we rely on the insanity my feed which has crap estimates estimates a billion in 2024 cash flow i'm sure that's not right there's a billion a stock based comp last year Oof. Well, last 12 months. So there's your cash flow. Cool. <laughs> and then you got 30 billion that you get to pay for. <sighs> That'll work. Okay, okay, question but but once you... it gets to scale, then then like, all that the, money is going to flow. <laughs> what's the London Stock Exchange trade for? Like that's an actual business. Mm. It was for sale. It was it went up, I think. Yeah. It's I probably think... it's like the, it's like the same multiple. This makes no freaking sense. I think it went for like four and a half billion pounds, but this is a while ago now, 10 or 15 years probably. Yeah. So, who bought the, oh, I just can't do it. Can't remember. What's SIBO? I, I don't understand what people are doing, man. I, I just don't get it. I, I, it's, it's a lot. You're paying a lot for a little. That's the answer. Well, it's on the come. Time will reveal. The right answer. Yeah. 
Well, the answer is there's no growth in relative, I guess, from like, I'd much rather on LSE or SIBO to Coinbase all day. But they're good I am a guy on a podcast. They're good businesses, yes. the exchange. They're a little bit cyclical, but they're, they're not, otherwise not really, they're probably not going away. I don't know. Is the American Stock Exchange still there? Well, what did that become? Uh, I think it's swallowed. It's probably nicey now. What happened to that one that was like the long term stock exchange? Remember when that was trying to get going a couple years ago? They had some kind of like I think they were doing some kind of delay on the on the uh bids so that you couldn't do the high frequency trading and that there seemed like who some was intelligence that? Was that behind Mark that. Mark Andreessen pushing that. Who was the I thought it was yeah. the guy originally founding it was some was a I think an Asian American guy. I can't remember who it was now. New York Stock Exchange acquired the American Stock Exchange. And I think um, just fold all the, the listings into the – does the ASA – does it still exist? I'm um, sure it's some subsidiary. I don't know. How, I don't know how, like the routing you might be able to see it on. But I, I think the problem with the long-term stock exchange, Jake, is it's not a great business model. You see, you want to encourage the trades <laughs> and the commissions. Yeah. So – that may have been the fundamental flaw in what those are rookie a numbers. Idea. You're going to you need to pump those fees. up. <laughs> yeah, you do get listing fees. That's true. Yeah. That's but they probably they probably listing fees probably depend on volume or market cap or something like that. What happened over at the long term stock exchange, Rick Santelli? Well, today it traded ten million dollars volume. Next, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> I haven't seen a good rant out of him in a while. Have you? I feel like he's. Oh, I think he. I think he top tick rates, if I recall correctly. But I don't watch the, the network enough. Top yeah. tick rates suggesting they were going higher. Yeah, I did watch. I watched David Faber and Malone. Faber is the man. He is a great interviewer. That guy. But Malone had some interesting things to say. Oh yeah, like what? I don't think they're particularly bullish on Paramount's future. Um, and I'm, I don't know. They're very, they're very cavalier long-term about fixed wireless. I'm not sure I understand it, but then again, I also kind of do. So I, th I think, I think there's these times in history where the difference between being right and wrong is very thin. And then when you look back at it you're like, of course people were right then seemed obvious yeah right now is not obvious to me probably to other people it is not to me yeah although in the five years of this podcast have there been that many times where it felt super obvious the melt up <laughs> the melt up felt obvious and good only to I you like i don't feel yeah. like toby and i were on team melt up yeah, i was on well, team melt down i <laughs> wish i was on team exit the melt up when i was but whatever it's been amazing to watch some of those round trips just oh in every gosh yeah it's been i i think like a, a lot of the things that i think are really interesting i i think peloton would fundamentally be a good brand today if the if the pandemic never happened mm. but once you go to disney and you start seeing fat guys in peloton gear like it's no longer really a fitness thing anymore, right? It's just kind of something that everyone can have. And I think, of, like, there was something. I think, I think when it was just a hardcore cycling network of people, there was something uh, like club-like about mm -hmm. it. And once it got mainstream, it kind of lost a little you know, bit of what like made it's it just cool. Like every other exercise, yeah, fad just any ever. other fucking bike, you know. But, but don't you think it's like every other fad? Like, there's both like the sitting in basements. I don't think so. Single... I mean, I mean, look at Ferrari, for instance. They've been able to always undersell the the demand in such yeah. a way that discipline has kept them from just being another car. Yeah, I th I think that Peloton could have maybe, I mean, done something not, yes, yeah, similar to that, right? If they had gone tried to sell n minus one bikes or n minus a hundred to to you know to really mm -hmm. err on that side of like, because. Something that is consistently interesting to people, at least from what I've seen, is cycling classes and people that like cycling 
that is a very serious group of of people that enjoy that type of workout. And I I think they're not the only business that that happened to. And it's kind of interesting to look back three years and be like, man, that may have been the worst thing that ever, what was perceived to be the best thing that ever happened yeah. to that company was actually the worst. Yeah. I think you're probably right. I don't know. I mean, Zoom, Zoom obviously benefited and kept it, right? We're on Zoom right now. Whether or not the stock is a good buy is different, but you know, it, it accelerated that, that company, but Peloton, I, mean, I actually think the pandemic hurt. Zoom is no curate. So that's ah, oh, <laughs> my beloved Q. When that, that, that's another really good. Has one. that already run out? Has the timeline run out on that? Oh yeah, that was gone a long time ago. Unfortunately, it can't have been that because I thought you you were smart. You're like two years plus a Christmas shopping se- session. Yeah, yeah, just long enough to get that extra fire in the warehouse. And- Squeeze that <laughs> bit. Yeah, man. That you know that what was so interesting about that is is for so long they were investing in that warehouse after I, I'm pretty sure it was after the HSN QVC. I, I think that warehouse came with HSN. I, I may have that slightly wrong, but they really drove a lot of efficiency through that warf- warehouse. And then it's like you get the core of your logistics catches fire. And now all of a sudden you're not serving your best customers and your best customers, you know, start to get mad. And then the ones that came in that were performing well leave. I'm like, fuck that. That was a shame. I love that hard, business. It's a hard game. And that's where all the debt makes you fragile to that type of thing, right? Yes. Got, uh, yes. I today. reluctantly will admit that. JT. Yeah, I do. Shout out to the homie, keep, David Rollinson. Keep the string. Who, keep the string unbroken. I don't know if he would like me calling him his homie, but he's a great guy. Great guy. <laughs> all right. All right. Veg, veggies. We, uh, so as you know, I was in London last week, and uh, I, I while I was there, I took the family to see Stonehenge, and so that's what's in my background here. I actually took this picture, uh, and I have to say, I was quite impressed with it. A lot of times, those things sort of underwhelm, um, but the stones are a lot bigger than you might expect, and there's this feeling that you're really on hollowed ground, and I, I felt like I was part of some deeper history while I was there. So there's kind of an aura to it, uh, and so a little bit about it, it was built in several construction stages over 1500 years and starting in 3000 BC. So we're, I mean, this is 5,000 years ago, which is absolutely insane. Um, and they really are a feat of kind of ancient engineering, but uh, we should probably also note that uh, they weren't smart enough to know that it was BC at that point. Uh, but we had this uh, lovely tour guide and shout out to Lucy. And she taught us uh, all kinds of historical facts while we were there. And, and one involved a bit of magic. And so Geoffrey of Monmouth was a Catholic cleric from Wales who lived around 1000 AD. Uh, And Stonehenge at that point was actually like four fifths of its sort of known age by then, uh, which is kind of a crazy way to frame it. Uh, But Geoffrey is remembered for his. Wait, can you explain that to me? Well, 1000 AD was a thousand years ago. And then you had 4000 more years before that when Stonehenge was built. Ah, okay. I think I do follow. Yeah. Roger. so this uh this Jeffrey was he's remembered for his his structuring and shaping of the Merlin and Arthur myths. Uh and his works created the the vast popularity which still continues today and and he's viewed as the major establisher of the Arthurian canon. And so before that the stories were basically like an oral tradition like Homer's Iliad. Uh and one of Jeffrey's stories in there was how how Merlin moved Stonehenge. And the legend goes that Merlin had giants pick up the stones and transport them to their current site uh, on Salisbury Plain and reassemble them there as a monument to Britons who were killed while fighting invading Saxons. And so th- they were effectively like giant tombstones. And the odd thing mm. is, is that that Jeffrey was actually right, not about the giants and the magic, but that the stones were moved from far away. Uh, and in fact, they they were moved 180 miles uh, from Wales and and relatively recently, we found out that the site where the stones, like we found the actual site where, where they originated. Uh, and so there's this kernel of truth in the ancient story of Merlin that like it had been hiding there all along in plain sight uh, that they had been moved. And, you know, Taleb's pointed out before that there's often something smart that emerges from the crucible of history of kind of old wives tales. Like, why does it keep getting passed down? And, you know, for instance, like it's bad luck to put your hat on a bed, apparently, and uh, that's not because it's bad luck, but it's because that like increases the chances of you transmitting lice or bed bugs or whatever in your, if you put mm. your hat on the bed. 
Um, and then there's also the Lindy effect, which, you know, the longer that something's been around, the more likely it is to persist. And th there must be a reason why it existed for so long that, you know, it's been able to survive volatility and stress for that whole time period. So it's probably able to survive future volatility. And, the, you know, this kind of also harkens back to the segment we did on Chesterton's fence, where, like, don't take down a fence that you don't understand why, you know, or why it's there to begin with. Um, so, and there's actually some math around the Lindy effect, right? Where there's, there's, there's an, imagine that there's an equal probability between something being like 1% of its lifespan and then 99% of its lifespan. So if you think on average, there 50% is the mathematical average, obviously. So if you know nothing else, then halfway through the lifespan is sort of the logical guess. Um, so anyway, hearing all these ancient stories got me thinking, are there investment truths from antiquity that we might might be wise to explore? Was anything so, carved on the on the like value spread is wide, hoping, <laughs> hoping for value spread to close anytime? Yeah, actually, now. it said like sell and may or, and go away. Or, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So the first one uh, we'll talk about is Aesop's fables and specifically his observation that a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Uh, and so, you know, we're using, this is like gets into appropriate discount rates, risk minimization, uh, you know, the time value of resources, maybe even a little bit of like over certainty bias and, and variance drain if we squint hard enough. Uh, but, you know, I, I think there's something to be said about betting on sure things, right? Like when that, it's kind of what Buffett would probably tell us. Um, Next, we have a, a verse from the Bible, and this is uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. And, and in this, King Solomon says, Cast your bread on the surface of the waters, for you will find it after many days. Divide your portion to seven or even to eight, for you do not know what misfortune may occur on the earth. So after all this debate that we've the three of us have had over the years, we now know what the ideal position sizing is, and it's apparently seven <laughs> or eight holdings. Uh, so I'm glad that we could put that to bed. Um, and then lastly, what we'll cover is the, the, the Talmud portfolio. And this is, you know, the, the Babylonian Talmud was this like book of kind of ancient wisdom, uh, and it was compiled around the year 500 AD. So this 1500 year old wisdom is, it's kind of like, it's old portfolio management and asset allocation strategy. And, and I think this is the first time I heard about it was probably from our friend, Meb Faber, who's talked about this before, but, but the Talmud portfolio is one third in business one third in land, and then one third in reserves at hand, you would call it. So, I mean, what do you guys think should, how would you, that then, how would you break that up then? Like one third in business? Uh, what do you think that that counts? Yeah. No, I think that would be one third real estate, one third cash. Yeah. That, yeah. That's possibly true. Yeah. I, I kind of like, what is it? The Markowitz portfolio, the 25, 25, 25, 25. What's the other 25? Like, you got like gold, cash, bonds, equities. So, I mean, that's not far off probably from what this is. So I would, you know, like business, you would put private equity in stocks, uh, land, you know, maybe more called like real assets, I would say, you know, like real estate, commodities, probably. Um, I don't know what else you might stick in there. And then um, <clears throat> and then the reserves, probably cash, bonds, gold, crypto. crypto. Sure, crypto, of course. Got to do crypto. <laughs> yeah. Anytime you can get, you know, 12 years worth of Lindy, effect for for something stability of a of an asset that's what you want to go for uh, anyway so there's there's a few pieces from antiquity that might be some some ancient wisdom uh while i was this is what i was thinking about while i was wandering around stonehenge did you see the did you have a look at the notch that lines up for uh the solstice i did yeah and there's, there's, there's like one that's shaped like this and one that's there's one that's a peak and one that's a the yeah. Or something like that. So that yeah, the other one I think is for the summer, and there's one for the winter, supposedly, and they they both are captured there. Are they not a different? Are they not just? Is it not just? I think they're different. I, I mean, I I don't I remember don't exactly the spec the specifics of it, but I just remember being impressed that impressed that they could figure out like on this day that like perfectly lines up. Yeah, that's pretty good. How'd they do that. And also, I I didn't realize this either, but like on the. You know, it's like, you know, let's say like two pillars and then a stone sitting on top of it. Well, on top of those pillars, there'll be like sort of a like a knob on top of it that had been carved into it, like a, a dome. And then on the top piece, they it's hollowed out to match that dome. So it like sort of almost like a Lego sits on top of it. Um, so they're not just like resting on it um, in a, 
you know, haphazard way, like it's perfectly designed to fit together and, and that helps with the stability, which is how you probably needed to do it to keep it from falling over for 5,000 years. What you, what, it's truly what's the amazing. chance of somebody knocking it over? Uh, like by yourself as a human? No way. Yeah. They they weigh okay, like... But like what about Toby and I after, <laughs> I don't know, kettlebells for two straight weeks and a whole bunch of protein? Then yes, definitely. Okay. I, I, they weigh like 40 to 50 tons. I mean, yeah, they're dude, we, uh, we not going to move each, that. Each one. You're not, you're not moving that. It's we protected. might need one NFL lineman, Toby and I, but we'd be good. How If you got a big enough running start, <laughs> yeah, that would clearly yeah. work. No, it's that's that's really interesting. Did you um I, I don't expect you to say yes, but I, I think you would like my yes. interview with this guy, uh Andrew McAfee, or and and he wrote this book, The Geek Way, and it's about how humans work together and and changing group behavior and stuff. And one of the examples that he gave. Um, I'm going to mess it up, but he, he's basically talking about like how we pass things on to each other, but, but as a civilization, we need to work together. And like, he, he used the example of fire. Mm. And if you just had to create fire, like I think any of us, it, if we were sent out into the wilderness tomorrow, there might be like 10 of us that could survive, but we don't really know how to create fire anymore. Right. And it's like, yeah collectively working together as a group and you look at something like stonehenge i mean how did how did it how do it work like how did they do it back then how is it this like perfect still it's amazing what what humans were able to do i you know the pyramids whatever it's just it's have we really gone have we really evolved that much is is a question not not like from a dna standpoint i mean we're not much different than them how well, the, even how even they technologically, move that so far, I mean, though, like hundreds of miles to move these giant stones when you just dragging them along, basically. That's what I'm saying, right? And like, we, my wife and I were on Santorini, and there's um, when when the volcano erupted there, it covered this this civilization that lived there, and they've excavated it, and like the the technology that they had and the plumbing that they had and the ability to run like actual working plumbing through the city back then it's like i mean obviously you know they weren't on zoom and whatever but i think i think technology it, it's amazing humans have always been very very did, technologically uh, savvy did that interview did, did he talk about uh like i pencil have you heard of this so it's Leonard Reed was the one who wrote it. And it's the idea is that like literally no one on earth knows how to by themselves make a pencil. Hmm. All the little pieces, the components, you know, like how do you mine the lead? How do you like it's all distributed in our brains across, you know, hundreds, thousands of people that have to combine together just to make a simple pencil. Yeah. Huh. That would be similar, I think, but different. But same. But but the same. I think you'd like that book. I I think you'd like that book a lot, actually. Sounds um, like something I'd be into. Yeah. A lot of it's like avoiding hierarchy. He's um he's a professor at I think it's MIT. Hmm. And you know, he just I, I guess he noticed a common denominator on how he doesn't think tech is the right word because like GM has a bunch of tech in it, right? So you can't call GM not a tech company because they do have tech. So he, he called this group of companies that does business in a way that eliminates sort of hierarchy and um, I guess politics for lack of a better term. He called that the geek way. And that's why the book's called the geek way. And it's interesting. So that's right. that. Coming to the other thing Amazon that, that box near me soon. <laughs> Yeah, the other thing that your your veggies reminded me of a little bit is like there's so Peter Mantis is pitching the idea of these life sciences companies, and I think some of the smaller ones, if you can get your head around them, like some of the higher valuations, you know, there might have been a grain of truth in what people saw, and now that small caps have been decimated and i i don't care what the sector is i just think there's probably some opportunity still from this grain of truth turning into you know misery in people's accounts and people still don't want to touch this stuff it's i 
I'm convinced there's opportunity in small. Convinced. Like cheap, cheap pipelines, basically. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm sure it's throughout throughout different industries. I mean, I, but I just think that there's things that ran up and then got decimated. It's got to be a good hunting ground in general right now because I, they have not reflated all the way. I'm certain of that. Yeah, the universe of smalls is quite big at the moment because it includes a whole lot of mid caps too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, former mid caps. Yeah, yeah, soon to be micro caps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it seems to be the trend. Unless you're uh, right before it's not though, mega cap. right? I mean, it's the trend until it's not the trend, and then you have the yeah, 1990s to 2007 scenario where it's like, oh wow, look yeah. at all these things that performed really well. They were left for dead. I mean, I look at the the expected. You know, if you look at small value versus the expected return and large growth, I think large growth is like half small value at the moment. But that's where small small value has no momentum. Large growth has a lot of momentum. So the momentum is a shorter term thing. It peters out eventually and then probably the underlying. Let me ask you guys a philosophical question. I've heard the thesis pitched before for Tesla as why it's a $30 trillion future market cap company because the biggest market cap at any given kind of era has kind of grown at this somewhat geometric looking rate, right? It's a, like 10x whatever it was before. And so if you go work backwards, you know, and, and that that line does hold up to be true. Um, do you guys think that there's any kind of upper, is there a natural limit to that? Is there an upper bound where there's like, you would say like, well, no, you can't go from 3 trillion to 30 trillion on the next round. Or is that, uh, or do you think there is some truth to that? I think it's highly likely that the next one is in that sort of scale. I don't know if it gets, to, I don't know how long it takes to get to 30, but certainly in my lifetime, there'll be a 30. By 2030. Too soon, I would mm. say. But yeah, that's, in, that's, but, that's soon. And I don't think it'll be Tesla. I think it could be Microsoft or Google or something like that. At 30 trillion. Wow. Open AI? Print enough money. And... Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's, yeah, that's, yeah, well, that's fair. I mean, that's part of the equation for sure. 2030 seems too close, but, but it's not, it hasn't grown at a 3% rate like inflation either. So, I mean, it wasn't there's... that long ago that 1 trillion was I remember, unheard when, of. When did, when did we go through 1 trillion? When was, who was the, what was the first trillion dollar company? Is it Amazon? Uh, I don't know. Apple? Microsoft. I would be my. Like I I thought my first thought was Microsoft. My second thought was Apple, and I thought self. The second thought's probably right. So there's a few now, right? And there's and Microsoft's at three. Yeah. So ten, I guess, is the next mark. Mm. And yeah. Then 10, to th- ten to thirty, like that could happen. But at some point, how? I mean, you have to have the income to justify yeah. that valuation, and we're starting to talk about huge so, percentage of gdp to make that happen i mean that's the thing so with tesla you've got to believe you've you've got to truly believe in the royalty per mile driven as the as like an efficient use of capital i think one and and two it's got to be capitalized in a major way and then you've also i think got to believe in power generation and i think you probably also have to believe in the idea that these robots are going to hop off of autonomous trucks and like fix the trucks. And so they own the delivery. And then I think you also probably have to believe like one or two more other things. And I have a hard time believing any of those things. So I'm, I'm not, I mean, like, we'll see this cyber truck looks as goofy as the Aztec to me. And <laughs> I, I mean, Maybe I'm wrong. I heard Musk say it's the most utilitarian car that he, you know, that he could possibly think of. I guess we'll sort of see. I, I'm, I like the Model S. I, I think what he's doing with the Model Three is really interesting. I, I think he's trying to drive down the cost to the point that, like, that it is truly a commodity for people to own, and that they don't care whether or not they rent one or it comes to them autonomously or whatever, and they're just kind of all fungible. I think it's an interesting vision. 
When if you when has anyone ever wanted to pay one hundred fifty thousand dollars for utilitarian? That's well, but but money. that's that's a that's a first adopter. I mean, to I I agree with you, but I I think his point would be I've got to get him out, and then I'll drive the cost down. I understand people think he's a fraud. Forgive me for saying anything not, positive about it's him. Not a fraud. It's, there's no way he's a fraud. I mean, the cars are real. It's the the launches are real. All of that is real. Yeah, well, he might be promotional, but like, it's no no entrepreneur. He's not going to get to where he is if he's not promotional. You just have to be. You got to sell yeah, the vision. That's right. I, I want a few put put your guesses in for the what's the for the next thirty trillion dollar company, Ooh. and when we hit there, we'll go back and we'll revisit and we'll give the. Uh, Nostradamus, the shout out, David. It's a uranium company. Jokes on yeah. y'all. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Whoever lands the gold asteroid. <laughs> Demetrius yeah. Kutsumpos says TSMC, Intel, or Samsung. So good wow. bets. Apple from Drew Ector. Drew, Drew also says Saudi Aramco. There you go. There's an off. That's fair. A, off the off the run guess. Yeah, I mean that's an oil and gas one. That's probably peak oil. Peak mod, hmm. peak multiple on peak oil. I don't know, man. Thirty trillion is a whole lot of money. Tesla. There is a Tesla guess. The the last, I'm pretty sure, it's still the last earnings call on Tesla is worth a listen. I th- I thought it was a fascinating call to listen to. I mean, it Chevron was just. Exxon. He was talking about how the increase in interest rates. Maybe we've talked about this. If we have, I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself, but. He was talking about how the in cost, the the increase in interest rates has offset what he's been able to do to drive the cost of the Model Three down. And since people buy a payment, the total cost has not moved. And he was lamenting that a little bit. And then he was talking about like how hard he thought the Cybertruck would be to develop and and, and manufacture, not develop, right? But to actually manufacture and. The whole time I thought this dude thinks different and I still don't understand and I don't need to. The cyber well, that, truck that is, is supposed to be out on the 30th. Cyber Friday? Mm. No, Cyber Thursday. Mm. What's I mean, that's always that's something we've talked about before that's always I've never really I don't think I've ever come to a good answer, but that idea of low rates kind of overclocking the natural exploratory mechanism of of capitalism looking for like let's try new things let's throw spaghetti against the wall and low rates would theoretically there's more money available to throw spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks and maybe you kind of explore the boundary at a faster rate and maybe you find new technologies that um so i can kind of get where musk is coming from i don't know if that's i don't know if the cost though is necessarily worth it like you end up with potentially you destroy a lot of capital along the way. And I don't know exactly yeah. how you tell whether that burn rate was worth the, uh, the juice was worth the squeeze. Yeah. I, I, I think I agree on that, but I said a question. I don't, I don't know the answer. That's uh, that's what I think I agree on. I, I don't <laughs> think I know either. I think yeah. I, I think I'm exactly in the same spot. What's the, what's the Peter Thiel thing? We were promised flying cars and all we got was, 140 what, characters. That was Twitter. <laughs> Twitter. Well, I don't sure, know. That's kind of, it's on him as much as anybody, no? Hmm. He gave us Facebook. Yeah, that's... it is. I mean, I, I'm not sure it's, it, I think life's quite nice. And, uh, you I know, mean, I, I agree with him that there's been an over. Maybe there were, for a while there there was an overemphasis on information technology as tech, and and less so on materials and uh, you know biology, uh, hardware like other things that are more might be would have been considered old tech right like airplanes used to be like super tech at that you know at a certain stage. Yeah. Well, I think you're going to see a lot of tech in the body. We'll see. I mean, like this CRISPR stuff that got approved in the UK. I'm, I'm, I don't know what it is. It's very provocative. <laughs> I like it. No, but I'm, I'm like rooting for it. And there was a good, there was a good uh, breakthrough, I guess, that the Washington Post wrote about today. I tweeted it out about, you know, hopefully they can figure out a way to mitigate some cancerous 
effects by reducing some genes that I think the spine lets out. I don't know exactly what it is, but I'm just saying I'm positive. Yeah. Anything to lower medical costs would be a huge, huge win for, for yes. us. Well, Me too. AI, 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 AI for the algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to the top of the charts now. All right, <laughs> uh, dudes. That was fun. Indeed. Good session. Have a good one. Billy, we got to have you back on and before Ooh. the end of the year so that we can Shout go out through to the 10. Go the through all our, our predictions and see how bad we were. No, no. I am going to pretend that I didn't do any predictions <laughs> and then we'll make other predictions.